Welcome. It's really delightful to be here. It's a privilege. I'm so honored. This place is uplifting. We're here to talk about a very pedestrian matter, and that is walking. And why would anyone talk about walking? Um, that's something we all did when we were one year old, right? We learned it. We're done with that. Now why are we bringing this up again? Well, the reason is that most of us have forgotten how because of numerous really unfortunate cultural practices, you know, be begin very early in life, you know. We are molding and modeling our citizens to have very poor structure and then with that goes the gate as well the locomotion, as you can see here, you know, and this comes with a high cost. There is a lot of pain and dysfunction and disfigurement and inability to get around that comes with poor structure, poor gait. Walking can be a tremendously constructive activity strengthening, stretching, it can provide a lot of your exercise needs if it's done well, or it can be really destructive, where you're kind of creating a little earthquake with every step you um, take, and all your joints are getting a major rattling, and your muscles are obliged to tense up, and you're just getting a lot of wear and tear, unnecessary wear and tear through the system. So there are three kinds of populations that I recommend we look to as models for how to be our very best selves in structure and in locomotion. And those are young children before they are kind of distorted by modern ways. Um, also our ancestors, if you go back in time, you look at old art, look at old photographs of 100 years or more um, old, and other cultures that have still preserved their more traditional ways, so non-industrial cultures, as you see here. And one thing you will notice about people in these cultures and the way they move is that there is a sameness. There's a similarity from one individual to the next. So for example, in this slide, if you were to look at the people at the front of the, you know, if you look at the him and him, there's something similar. And what's happening in the back leg, the back leg is straight, the buttock is engaged. There's a lot of similarity in the way they move, which is, and in our culture, that's different. People move all kinds of ways, you know? We have the kind of model walk, and then we have a kind of, people move very many different ways, and in these cultures, there's kind of a standard issue way to be, and, um, and move if you're a homo sapien, yeah? And that kind of suggests that maybe this is a natural way because very different cultures, different geographies, different genders, different ages, sharing the same way to move and be is kind of compelling. This is a group of Af African women that I observed in Burkina Faso, that is sub-Saharan Africa. And here also you see, for example, the way their feet are oriented, that they all have about the same angle out. And when you see that, and you see it in them, and you see it in the Bushmen, and you see it in uh, little kids, then it starts suggesting that maybe that's our natural way. And maybe it behooves us to go back to that way. This is a group of ancient e Greeks, and here too you can see that elongated spine and um, rather straight spine, and then very strong glutes propelling them forward, in this case in running. So very strong engagement here in the buttocks. Another thing you notice about these populations is that they look, they have a certain elegance and kind of beauty and dignity. And that, I believe, is also our birthright and our natural heritage. And that's another thing that I encourage everybody to look for. You know, as a human being, you have that in you. 
And there's another characteristic that is common to these people, and that is how functional they are, how impressive their, their distances, the speed with which they move, how much they can carry. It's very amazing. If you go to these villages and they've got stuff on their head and they've got it on their side, handlebar and something on the back and something in this hand, and, and they, don't, they manage and they do it Easily, they do it effortlessly. They don't get into trouble doing these things. And in fact, there is research showing that they do this effortlessly. Um, this is a research paper by Norm Hegland and his team in which they compared the Kikuyu tribes women of Africa with US military guys. So these US military guys were at their young strap, you know, they were really strapping. They, loaded them up, in their case with backpacks, that's the way they carry weight, and then they measured their energy consumption as a way of um, gauging how efficient they were in, you know, their oxygen consumption. And as expected, their oxygen consumption when loaded rises. The Kikuyu women, you load them up, and in their case it's on the head, and you measure their oxygen consumption, and lo and behold, it goes down. Well, this was very unexpected. So the, rest, the remainder of the paper goes into a whole pendulum action, and basically they shift to an even more efficient way of walking when they're loaded. So they're actually using less energy. It's crazy, but true. Um, so there's a, there's, and if that is not enough reason to motivate you to um, take a look at these people and learn from them, I, you know, basically what we do is guided mimicry. You know, we coach people with lots of hands-on to, to copy them. And here is another reason. If, you, if it's not enough for you to want to be elegant and self-possessed uh, um, and smooth and efficient and high-functioning, do it because you're going to avoid what most people in our culture face at some point or other. Our incidence for Low back pain is 85%. It's a rare person that is not going to have back pain, severe enough to have to go to their doctor and get help with it. You know, We've lost um, our knowledge of how to use our bodies so that we don't have this kind of pain. And these people still have it. So it's, it's getting harder and harder to find these populations. And when these populations adopt Western ways, they're actually worse off than we are because they don't have the kind of mediating um, help of Advil or a day off from work or so. You know, if they lose their ways, it, it's very bad. They do, they do really badly. So it's, it's harder to find those people who still have old and wise ways intact in their community. This is a chart that shows disc narrowing with age. And as you would expect, the discs narrow, which is a sign of wear and tear, with age for, for example, sedentary workers. You know, we all blame sitting jobs for our, many of our woes. And, but if you look at it, this is, you know, people in the modern West, but actually, you know, you have to do something to make your living. And if you're doing manual labor, you're actually worse off. So it's not really fair to blame sitting. You know, sitting prevents you from worse stuff happening. Um, in any, in any case, both whether you're doing you know, sedentary work or manual labor, you're not very well off in Western society. And where you really want to be is here with the Beel tribals of central India, um, where you can see that at age 50, their discs are indistinguishable from the 20-year-olds. So they keep these pristine discs. So that's what we want to understand. How do they do that? You know? And if they can do it, Surely we can too, you know, same species. And that's what this work is about, my work. The, my method is about helping people find their way back to pain-free living and a normal, um, functional life. 
Now, one aspect you may have noticed in, all of, in some of the slides I showed is that when these people walk, they use their glutes very significantly. Okay? And I'm actually going to invite you. I know this is very crowded, but we only need one step. And if you stand sideways, I think you will be able to do this. And I would like to invite that those of you who wish to join in, stand up, and we're going to take, I'll demonstrate first. We're going to take one step like this, OK? And we are going to try to find this muscle up top, OK? I'm going to show you a couple more slides so you have an idea what I'm, here I am in Africa learning a very good way. This is a, you know, learn from people who really know what they're doing. You copy them. So when, if you see immigrants or sometimes athletes, sometimes kids walking really well, just turn off your brain, walk behind them, and copy. And if you look like the woman in the red skirt, you can see how her glutes are working. So not the best of videography on the part of my, my um, translator here. <laughs> you can see that there's work in the, in the glutes. And, oh, we want a little bit more. Let's going a little further, can we? OK, so that, so if you use your glutes like that, with every step you take, you are going to get some really strong glutes. I mean, these are some seriously strong glutes, right? <laughs> so which brings me to another reason you might want to do this is, hey, who doesn't want to look like that, right? So. That, you know, I've been talking about the glutes as one muscle. Well, there are actually several muscles. It's a whole group. And you want to use maximus, which is, you know, the big muscle. But you also want to use medius. So if you look at this muscle up top, outer quadrant, that is gluteus medius. And you would like it to work with every step you take. It helps land softly, among other things. It helps keep the pelvis stable. It does a lot of things. It helps your legs externally rotate, which will help the knees, knee health, and so on. There are a whole list of things, reasons why you want to be using that muscle. And most people don't. They kind of, you know, and nothing much is happening here. And, and then your butt gets sadder and saggier with the years. <laughs> And so you want to have this lift going on. And now is a good time, with that kind of inspiration, I'm going to invite you to stand up, face sideways, and get that muscle going. So it's one little step in place. So if you stand sideways, I think you've got it. You've got enough room. And now you're trying to find that. So it's one stride. And the rear leg, the buttock of the rear leg is squeezing. OK, so you squeeze it. And if you found it, it kind of picks up your muscle. If you have trouble finding it, you want to face forward, turn your left Turn your back foot facing out, OK? So your feet are kind of L-shaped. And then squeeze. And it's a little easier to find that way. And if you still have trouble finding, lean on something like your chair or something. And with your foot facing out, raise that leg. See, you're raising that leg, and now you got that muscle going. There's no way to raise your back leg with your foot facing out and not get that muscle to fire. OK, everyone found it? Yeah. You raise your leg, you get that muscle, woke it up from a deep sleep in some cases, <laughs> and now you're going to lay that leg down on the ground and keep the contraction, OK? So there you go. So that's your gluteus medius. So set the leg down firmly and keep that contraction. You got it on one side, switch sides. So one leg is forward, one leg is back. The back leg wants to face out a little bit. So your feet are like an L shape. And now you're going to lean forward and slightly raise that back leg. So it's kind of like a fire hydrant pose. <laughs> <laughs> or if you want a better image, think about a ballerina, you know, like an arabesque. So lifting it up, getting that muscle to squeeze, now set it back down, keep the squeeze. Okay, that's your gluteus medius. Okay? 
Now, one take, so you can go ahead and sit down because we don't have the space to walk around, trips around here. <laughs> but I'd like all of you to consider looking for that muscle as you leave because every step really, truly wants to include a squeeze of that muscle. So every step becomes a rep. Okay? And, and then you get there. <laughs> so it's not just the Ubang tribesmen and the village Africans that have their behinds out behind them. And you figure it's called a behind for a reason, right? If it was meant to be somewhere out front, it would have been called something different. So it's out there, and it used to be out there when you were little. This is not you know, some unusual architecture. This is all of us when we were one or two years old, and we had our behinds behind. So how come now we're being suddenly told that we should be tucking our pelvis? It doesn't really make sense. How many people have been told to tuck their pelvis at some point? Hands? It's about like, a good number. It's the current thinking is that we're supposed to tuck our pelvis. And if you look at all these populations, and I'm talking any population going back 100 years, any kid, any person from a village in Africa or Ethiopia or, you know, in, or um, Ecuador, wherever, wherever, has this kind of structure. And so I call this a J-spine, by the way. You see how this upper part is pretty flat, pretty straight. And then it's the lower part, very low here, L5S1, that has an angle. You with me? So that, I call it a J spine, because it's much closer to a J, kind of stylized J, like a hockey stick, <laughs> rather than an S. Okay? So that's interesting. So your kids have it, the villagers have it, our ancestors had it, and here, on the right, you have an illustration from a medical text that was published in 1911. So catch here you have evidence that we used to think that that was normal, you know, and it's only in modern texts that you have this S-shaped spine, you know, where you go back, this is the upper back, this is the lower back, this is the so-called natural lumbar curve that all our ergonomic furniture is being created to fit, okay? Because we have this notion that that's the way our backs are supposed to be, we make our furniture that way. And we're given lumbar cushions to fill in this curve, and lumbar adjustment in the car seat, and so on. And if you think about it, it really doesn't make very good sense. Not only do none of, none of these populations that don't have back problems have that kind of shape, they have this kind of shape. They have a J-spine. They have their behind out behind and everything in the lumbar area is fairly flat. See, there's not a lot of curve in here. And the curve happens only low. There's where the bum would be. And there's another way to see that this makes sense. And that is every disk space in here is cylindrical. Well, that makes sense because all of those disks are shaped like cylinders. They're like little hockey pucks. So why would a hockey puck get stuck into a shape like that? Well, that's not going to work very well, right? And if that's what we're doing every day, all day. No wonder we have degenerative disc disease and things don't function well. And you're also stressing the edges of the bones here instead of stacking them up really nicely like in this picture. And so if that's what we're doing, no wonder we have osteoarthritis all through he these areas. And the muscles are tight back here and it's in general a mess. And so you don't want to be in that shape. You really want to translate you're, you want to change, transition to this. So let me teach you a little technique that will help you go from here to here. And it's um, Ken's favorite technique, he told me earlier today, and I call it stretch sitting. And we, don't, we didn't have enough cushions so that everybody could try this, but 
if you have a cushion behind you, you can use it. And I will demonstrate on stage. I happen to have my chair here. And it has a cushion kind of built into the back. So you can see that these are little friction nubs. And you have that. And what you can do if you don't have a cushion at home, you can use towel with friction. You need something with friction. I used to teach with a towel, but then the towels slip, and then people would complain and say you should design something, so I did. And so the, what you need to do is you put your towel behind you, and it wants to hit you mid-back, okay, somewhere like that. Not low back. You're not trying to create lumbar curve here, remember? You are trying to get rid of lumbar curve, trying to lengthen. So you set your bottom back in the chair, and now you're going to come away from the chair. And those of you who don't have a cushion, you can just go through the motions, imagine it. And then, and this chair is actually not bad. Maybe it can support you some. So you're coming away. Now you're going to lengthen your low back, and you use two techniques to do that. The first is you curve forward like this. Okay, it's like you're doing a little crunch. Okay, so it's like this. Your rib cage kind of curves forward. It's not that you lean forward from your hips, it's that you curl forward with your rib cage. And that flattens and lengthens the lumbar spine right there. Now you can additionally lengthen by grab pushing on the chair someplace. On the seat pan, if you have armrest, you can push on the armrest. You can also grab the back. Push this way. Some way of further lengthening the back. Okay? So you push down, and you're kind of climbing your back. Keep curving forward. Don't do the sit up straight thing. Sit up straight is a really bad guideline. You see what happens when I sit up straight? What happens to my back? Squinching, right? Curving. We're trying to undo that curve. So curve forward, push the top of you away so you're making yourself super tall, and then you're hooking yourself to the backrest. And then you relax. Now, if you're lucky and have one of these pads, you should be feeling some stretch. Anyone feeling some stretch? OK. So you have your bottom back repeat. Hinge away. Curve forward so as to lengthen, flatten the lumbar spine. Grab the chair someplace, lengthen further. Hook yourself like you're a picture hanging from the wall. And every point from the every place from the point of contact down is getting a little bit of a stretch. Okay, now you just sit there and you do your work. Right now, it would be also nice to have our shoulders in a better position. So let's do that. That's easy. Everyone can participate. You take one shoulder at a time. Let me see if we have some nice um, shoulder example. Like, see this guy's shoulder. See how it hangs far back along the body. That's what you want. You don't want your full arm hanging here or here. So instead of pulling it back, which doesn't last, right? Like how long does that last? Maybe 10 seconds? Whew. Right? Or sitting up straight, which we've just agreed does damage to your low back. Instead, you take one shoulder at a time. You take it forward. You go up. You go back, 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 back and you ratchet the shoulder back. And you just relax. And you'll discover, maybe to your surprise, that the shoulder remains back. Little forward, up, back. So when you're going back, don't stick your chest out. Don't do this, OK? So forward, up, back. You're just kind of ratcheting the soft tissue of the shoulder back a notch. It feels like that, OK? It's because of the architecture of the shoulder joint, this is the very best way to improve any hunching you have in the upper back. You do not want to pull back. You do not want to sit up straight. You just do your little shoulder roll. And then you'll discover, it feels a bit funny, you know, like you have little Tyrannosaurus Rex arms. <laughs> but you'll get used to it. And you come closer to your task and your wheel and whatever. And you are doing all kinds of wonders for this whole area. Because now you've restored normal circulation, breathing. You're not pulling on your back and making yourself more hunched with the years. 
Um, and there's all kinds of research showing that you actually improve your testosterone levels, fancy that, just by improving your shoulder position. There's research on this. And you're lowering your cortisol levels, so you're more confident, you are less stressed. There's a physiology that goes with certain kind of posture. And if you think about the animal world, it makes sense, right? When animals are depressed, sad, they stick their tails between their legs, right? And they hunch, and a happy dog has, you know, tail out, shoulders open. So, I mean, it makes sense that we have something similar going on in our bodies, the connection between the psychology and the um, And, you know, I made those arguments, but there's actually studies showing, supporting this as well. This is a study where they took 100 back pain patients and 100 people who don't have back pain and compared their spinal curves. This is one of the few studies that makes a distinction between upper lumbar curve and lower lumbar curve. Most of them just lump it together and lose the effect because, you know, it makes a big difference having flat up top, curved down below, rather than curved up top and flat down below. You know? So to really find the difference, they, they actually measured both. And they found a correlation. People with back pain tended to have, up, you know, like lumbar curve up top and tail tucked down below. And people who were the normals had more flat up top and behind behind. So they had more of a J spine, whereas the back pain patients had more of an S spine. Very supportive of what I'm claiming. So it's actually been studied. Um, so how do we go about changing things? You know, what's the recipe? Well, if you have influence over really young ones, exert that influence, you know, grandchildren, friends, children, whatever. They need to be carried well because this is the formative stage when your brain is getting set, when you're learning what it means to sit, you know. And if you're being stuck in a little car seat like that, then that's what your brain is learning. And then when you go to school, you're going to sit like that. And you're going to be at your first job like that. And that's why these kids are showing up with herniated discs in their 20s, which is not a way for our society to be strong and um, you know, functional. So you see how she's lengthening the kids back? That's one thing you want to do with a little kid. And also, let their behind be behind and their legs open. You want to externally rotate, which is why I don't like all those soft bottom chairs, like in the umbrella strollers and stuff. It's training the kids to do this and have knock knees and fallen arches, and now there's no room for their pelvis to settle and so on. And some of our mesh chairs, I don't like mesh for this reason. It encourages the legs to internally rotate, which is the opposite. I made my chair mushroom top so that you could X, you, it encourages you to externally rotate. It's very important. And you can put a wedge, you know, you can fix almost everything by putting in wedges and folded blankets and such. So carry your kids well and then give them decent furniture. Like you notice how that's a mini version, that's our child's version of this chair. And you see how uh, yeah, they've like got sloping down. This is fun. Yeah. Sorry? What about? The video is the interesting. Oh, it's talking. <laughs> That's okay. Don't worry about it. She's just saying how much she likes the chair. Uh, and so, but you can see how nicely it sits her. You know, she's got her her imaginary tail out behind her. You want to give them a chance. Don't give them something that's going to do this to them. You know, you want to check out there. And for kids, you use different language. You say, put your dragon tail out behind you. Or you say, ducky butt, not tucky butt. Yeah? You know, so, and you teach them by example. You teach them that if you pay attention to posture, then they're going to realize that it's something worth paying attention to. And then, going into adulthood, you want to preserve these habits. Like, you see what happens when you sit on your tail. This guy, see there's, 
And then what happens up top? <laughs> Relaxed and slumped. And then, you know, what would a typical parent tell their kid who's sitting like this? Sit up straight. And then he would be upright and tense. He'd get tired after a bit. And he'd, most people go back and forth between being upright and tense, which they think is good posture, it isn't, and then being relaxed and slumped, which everyone knows is bad posture. They're both bad posture. What you want is what this guy's doing, upright and relaxed. And what it takes is a well-positioned pelvis. Where's his tail, his imaginary tail? Out back. Okay, and that's what it takes to stack well. So it's not really a very good beginning point to start because what you don't want to do is stick your butt out. Then you're just tensing up these muscles and if you have a herniated disc or something that is even dangerous. So don't begin there. Begin with the stretch sitting that I showed you. And there's another thing, technique that's really helpful called stretch lying. That's Ken's other favorite technique that he tells me he does every day. So this uh, open, if those of you who have a book, open to page 59 and share it with your neighbors. And so what you do, this is your homework tonight. You go home and you get up on your elbows, just like you can see in that picture on page 59. You're going to mount your, you know, hoist yourself up onto your elbows. You're going to dig your elbows in and lay one vertebrae down. And then the next one, far, you know, putting a little extra distance by digging in your elbows, right? So you put one down and then you move your elbows out to the side. You put the next one down and so on. So you're unrolling your back, okay? onto the bed with some extra length. Is this getting it? Are you clear? And then you can do other things like lengthen the neck and slide the shoulders. There are details written there. But at the, you know, put in that extra length because it takes you two seconds to do. And you won't be the first person who wakes up in the morning very surprised to be in the same position you know, because you were so comfortable and it's like, whoa, I feel much better. My back feels better. I, you know, teased out some of that spasm and tension and compression. Basically, you're putting yourself in traction. And that doesn't take any equipment at all. You're just digging in your elbows, putting one vertebra down far away from the previous. Okay? If anyone has questions about that, by all means, ask. Um, it's pretty well laid out in the book. And by the way, the books are for sale. If anybody wants, they're usually $30. If anyone wants a book, you can pay $20 for it on your way in, in, in that area. Actually, I see Kathleen over there. You guys are very fortunate to have a local teacher. I put a lot of energy into choosing the right people and training the right people to coach others. And you have three teachers in Florida, and Kathleen lives in Gainesville. So she's around. She can travel. Um, I'm actually teaching this weekend, and we still have a couple of open spots if anyone wants to do that. It's the whole course. The course takes is six lessons. When it's done in a group, it's one and a half hours. We do, we do very small groups so everyone gets hands-on. It's capped at eight people. When I teach, it's ten people. And that's it, so that each person gets shepherded to having... We want it to be a life-changing experience, so we keep it like that. Um, this is the kind of change that we're used to seeing. This guy did the course. You can see how he was at the beginning over there. This is the way he used to sit. And here he's sitting. He now knows how to stretch sit. He's looking very different. It's not, and, you know, his pain and stuff is diminished. This is his stack sitting. He now knows how to use the edge of the chair when you don't have a, a wedge. In, in my chair, I, I designed a built-in wedge. It has a sloping front. In most chairs, what you need to do is fold a blanket, something, something that's wedge-like, so you can sit on it and your pelvis will be tipped forward. When you don't have a wedge, you can always sit on the front edge of the chair. Now, those of you who don't have back problems can try that now. But if you have a back problem, I strongly recommend not starting with stack sitting. It's not a good starting point. But if you don't have back issues, you might want to slide to the front of your chair and kind of arrange your 
tushy so that your imaginary tail is out behind you. And see, after you do your shoulder roll and such, see if it isn't easier for you to stack. Okay? So that's a little experiment you can do, but I like to teach this. This is what we teach in lesson two. Lesson one is all about stretch sitting and stretch lying and gaining you know, height, and then you can remodel your spine. But here he's doing the stack sitting on the edge of the chair. And this is the gun. This happens to be my husband, who was an early guinea pig. And you can see benefited greatly from having, from being very slumpy and slouchy and you know, um, having a lot of neck tension and stuff. He's 20 years older in the second picture, but you can see he's much more open in the shoulders, there's lots more room between his ears and his shoulders, he, he doesn't have the tension and stuff anymore. Um, so I'm going to just show you, this is part of your heritage, this is the Edward Mybridge photographs put in a kind of movie-like fashion, you can see the form, this is, it's wonderful that this has been captured for us. and. Um, I'm going to end with a clip that I took in uh, Brazil. This was just, you know, you see how, how, how beautiful his structure is when he's walking, squeezing his butt, straightening out his leg, and so on. So now, having reached us to Brazil, I am going to invite you to find a spot, if that pleases you, and we're going to do a little practice that I'm going to encourage you to take home. And it's kind of a pre-samba, okay? So we're going to have music, and we're going to go back and together, and back and together. So feel free to come up front. This is party time. Everything in Brazil ends in party. But you can also stay in your uh, seats. Um, suit yourself. And we're going to go back with one leg and then together. Now when you go back, we're looking for that glute meat squeeze, remember? This is practice for healthy walking. So we go back and squeeze the buttock and then come together. And you go back, squeeze, and together. Your body doesn't move, you just move your leg back, squeeze your butt, and come back together. Back, and together. And if you want, if you're adept, you can include a shoulder roll. Shoulder roll, same, <laughs> and together. And if that's too much to bite off, don't. So squeeze, and together. Squeeze, and together. So this, by the way, is, is an awesome study break. All right, well, that's been fabulous being with you. So yeah, this is, this is a good time for questions. If anybody would like to ask questions, please. Please remember to use the microphone for your questions. All right, Mike, Mike here, great. In the early part of your presentation, you showed some ladies, maybe half a dozen, from Burko Fasino, I believe. You mentioned their ankles. They were, and they were walking on a hard pavement, looked like macadam or asphalt. We know how hot macadam or asphalt can get here in warmer weather. Uh, what would it be like there, and how much and how long do they do that? Those women actually had um, flip-flops on. Um, but yeah, they traditionally walk barefoot, and it's very impressive. I, I have seen a film of the Kung Bushmen in a giraffe hunt, and they're barefoot, and they're you know walking and running, and then somewhere in the day they sit down and pull thorns that big out of their feet. So, you know, so there is a tolerance and a toughening and a callousing, and but also just a, a, a different kind of really relationship with pain and discomfort than I am used to. It's very, that's another impressive thing, yeah. 
but I'm not inviting you to follow that path. <laughs> um, I noticed the one gentleman that you sh showed a before and after, his chin seemed to go down. Yes. Is that? It's one of the things that I teach as part of primal posture and natural posture. Many people have learned to put their chin up. I mean, we even chin up, chest out, right? Boom, you already know what I think about that. And chin up is the equivalent in the other fragile part of your spine. The moment you put your chin up, you've just squished your cervical spine. So I encourage people to, and you will find in the book, I forget which page, you can gently pull back and tall, and that will result in your chin angling down. And that is actually a natural way. It, again, it'll feel funny if you're not used to looking out of your eyes this way. You've been looking at everyone this way. Then all of a sudden doing this feels very odd. But again, it's a thing to get used to. And I'm in the process of creating something to put on the head to remind people. So in the next week, that should actually be available on the website. Yeah. You have shoes that range from high heels to negative incline, like with uh, earth shoes. And I'm sure that figures into what you recommend and don't recommend. How, uh, there's a whole long story. It's a great question. Um, I'm one of the few posture experts who thinks some heel is just fine. And I mean an inch, an inch and a half. It can make up for short calves and actually allow your pelvis to tilt and then the butt to work and everything else to work normally. Now, you don't want to always wear heels because otherwise you adapt to having short calves. You know, you want to stretch them out sometimes as well. Um, I don't like negative heels for the reason that most people have short calves. If you give them a negative heel, they end up tucking. And now they've thrown everything off. So I don't think that's the solution. The solution to resetting your calf length is to walk the way they walk and actually leave the heel down longer with every stride. And there's your natural calf stretch. It's all built in, you know, it makes sense, right? These people aren't doing this exercise and five reps of this and 10 uh, rounds of that. They're just moving well. And so the reps are happening as they bend and walk and lift. And that's your, your everyday life becomes your exercise and your therapy. It makes sense. Do we need a mic? How, how do, what is the proper way to To bend? I really don't like showing people this, I, the proper way to bend, because this is a very bad way to begin. You first want to lengthen your spine, then you want to shape your spine, then you want to brace your spine, and then you preserve all of that. So in our course, it's lesson four that we reach you bending. You know, and it's, I call it hip hinging. I'll demonstrate here. You see that my back is staying exactly the way it was. It's got that little even groove running up and down, and this is the way they do it. This is the way the professional benders in the world bend. But if you do it slightly wrong, you round a bit, that's nasty. You're loading your disc, so don't do this. Don't fool around with this on your own. Um, get one of our qualified teachers to coach you. This really does take coaching. Microphone? Yeah, they can't hear. What do you do with walking with us people who have had fusions? Who've had fusions? Um, so, you know, my own story is not a clean, you know, you arrive at your passions the hard way often. I had a, not a fusion, but an L5-S1 laminectomy, discectomy. There's my battle scar. And it was a miserable story that went into that, was behind, you know, trying everything, like just feeling like you have an ice pick in your butt and not being able to sleep through the night, waking up every two hours to circle around the block to get out of muscle spasm, and I could go back to sleep, and it was just, and nothing worked. Not physical therapy and not chiropractic and not acupuncture and massage, you name it. I tried it, and so finally I had surgery. Okay. And then a year later, I had the same problem again, a re-herniation of the same L5-S1 disc. 
and you don't want to make a habit out of back surgery. Long story short, by doing the things I now talk about and teach, I was able to avoid the second surgery. Um, uh, it's been over 20 years I've not had a back ache, pain, ache, twinge, nothing, zero. Okay, so if you've had a fusion, you know, you want the, the vulnerable parts are the level up above the fusion, that's the next one to go very often. So all these lengthening things we're talking about, and I've only shown you a little bit, you also want to learn how to use your own muscles to lengthen because you can't always be sitting up against a backrest or lying stretched out in a bed. You know, sometimes you're up and around and then you want to be lengthened as well. So those are things to learn. I call it the inner corset, by the way. That's in lesson three of the course. And we also have a DVD for people who you know, don't have access to the course, or we have a DVD to bring the book to life. So I recommend that, it's available. Um, but, so you want to learn all these things. You know, if you've had an injury, or you have a genetic, you know, uh, condition, all the more reason to not add to the challenge with, with poor cultural habits. You know, you have extra reason to learn how to have good structure. Mike? Does that make sense? Yes. I had polio and I fractured my back many years apart, of course. Was With it this, from a fall? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a really hard fall. Yeah. Would this help me? So I'm in the middle of working with a woman who's had polio since her childhood. I had a woman who was started when she was 85 for 80 years. If she fell, she would have to crawl over to furniture and pull herself up. She had three withered limbs. Um, at age 85, for the first time, she could get herself up from the floor free. You know, she um, very dramatic. And got, she got rid of her pain enough that she went off, you know, she didn't use her walker anymore. She went off to vis visit her relatives in Germany. It was very, very dramatic. And the woman I'm working with now is, I mean, she's on some serious meds, you know, hydrocodone and, and stuff. And she was just telling me that, oh, she just forgot to take her medication. She knows better than to not, you know, not, not to do anything cold turkey, but, you know, she just hasn't had pain. I mean, I'm in the middle of working with her, so that's not finished yet. But it's very helpful for people who, now, in any given case, you never know, you know. I can never guarantee things, but, in any case, you want to work on your structure. And for most people, it's surprising how many things that helps. I don't, I don't take any medication, but um, if I stand for more than 10 minutes, I'm in. In fact, I'm very uncomfortable now. Yeah. So, you know, I think when, like I said to the other woman, you know, if you have some condition or some injury, all the more reason to not compound that with poor uh, movement patterns and structure. I see that you're a licensed acupuncturist. When and why would you use it? Good question. So. Um, I like acupuncture as a relaxation technique, and it sometimes can help reset muscle tension or some kind of pattern of nerve inflammation. But what it can do is override the systematic poor usage of a body. You know, if you're just using your body poorly, acupuncture is not going to fix that. So this gets to the root of the problem, but I like it as a, the way some people would use pain pills. I, use, I think of acupuncture in the place of pain pills. And for some people it can work very well. But you still want to get to the root of the problem. And that, that for me is like really examining the way you use your body. I think of acupuncture as kind of so, um, electrical work, and this is the, you know, hard, uh, hardware work. Yeah. She's 
spreading the wealth. Just. Uh, I'd like your opinion on this um, teeters that you see advertised. The he get, the man gets on the you know, the inversion tables. In, yes. Yeah. Um, I think traction is the right idea, mm -hmm. but my in my view, you need hours and hours of traction to make a difference. So 10 minutes on some table or half an hour in someone's office pulling you with the computer-aided whatever isn't going to cut it. Does it, uh, I mean, give space in the disk? Well, I mean, yeah, for but, you know, time? for half an hour or 10 minutes or what, and then okay. what? You know, then you're then gonna, it goes right back yeah. to the way it was? Well, I mean, often most often. And so what I think people need is a more uh, full-blooded, a, a more broad approach. And part of it is many hours of traction. So if you're doing stretch sitting and stretch lying, which you need to do anyway, if you need extra length in your spine, you better do these because you got eight hours if you have a sedentary job. You, that's a low-hanging fruit. You want to pick it. And you got another eight hours at night. That's a low-hanging fruit. Two seconds and you get eight hours stretch. Hey, you can't match that. And so if you're doing that, you got 15 hours, 16 hours of stretch a day. Now what is 10 minutes on a machine going to do. It's a drop in the bucket. Save yourself 800 bucks. Save yourself some r room with ugly furniture in your living room. And, you know, just, just uh, you know, do your own traction. And then you also need to learn how to use your own muscles to keep you long. No substitute for that. <clears throat> so really, there's no substitute for learning what to do with your own body. And once you do that, you're going to find a lot of these little gimmicky things are not real, don't make sense. Oh, oh. Um, what's your opinion of yoga? Ooh, anything that was de designed more than 100 years ago has a lot of wisdom built into it. The things I love about yoga is that you're doing so many things at the same time, you know, and I teach yoga, uh, you know, once people have learned the basics, and I think of, you know, sitting and bending, that's a yoga pose. We lavish as much attention on those poses, which we're doing all the time, makes sense, right, as we would on a yoga pose. But once you've learned that, there are some benefits, like, you know, if you do a pose like that, you're kind of patterning. You see how my leg is there, my butt is tightened, I am patterning the way I walk. Here, I reach up and I got my belly, my deeper belly muscles all, you know, that is patterning the inner corset that I alluded to earlier, right? I am paying attention to where my shoulders are. I'm not doing this, you know. So there's a lot going on at the same time, ideally. Now, having said that, yoga is also imported technology. It's made by yogis for yogis. And these are guys, and they are guys, who sat on the floor um, cross-legged to eat. They squatted on toilets. And so all the time they were growing up, when your cartilage becomes bone, they're doing all these uh, different postures than we do. So now you come to an adult Westerner who decides, oh, we've got to sit on the floor and we've got to squat and stuff, it doesn't work. It's too late. That bone, that bone got ossified when you were, depending on which joint you're talking about, 2 to 16. It's done. You can't edit that. You can pull and push all you want, and you'll just loosen your ligaments and create mischief. So that's why it's imported technology. It needs to be adjusted for local use. So instead of sitting on the floor and rounding your back trying to touch your toes, use some implement, use a, uh, you know, a raised surface, reach forward, you're bending forward, now it's a healthy pose. Whereas if I insisted on doing it more spiritually on the floor, I'm destroying every ligament and disc and not such a great idea. Okay, we have time for one last question. It's really been a great pleasure talking to you. Okay. Um, yeah. 
Have you found any populations of people in modern society that are moving right, whether it's a certain athlete or dancer or something like that? Yeah. You know, people who do stuff that was designed 100 years ago. You know, if the sport was designed 100 years ago, like I said about yoga, there's a lot of wisdom built in. So like the football players, how do, what's their position when they're doing this power position? That's a hip hinge. Why is it a hip hinge? Because in the 1800s when they designed all of this, that's the way people bent, you know? And so a runner, you know, run, people have been running forever, so you, runners will often really, because to be fast, to remain injury free, you have to have good form. And so they intuit it, you know, your body has some, in, there's inner logic. So if you're busy doing a sport um, that is old, you're likely to come at, not necessarily. I mean, you do, we do much better with some coaching and to really have it be honed to be primal, to be natural. But you have a better chance of, you sometimes, you know, athletes will have really good form. Um, little kids always, you know, that's where, those are our teachers. And then sometimes you see, you know, immigrants, and um, sometimes people just naturally, they were held well, you know, um, they were raised in a, a farm someplace and, you know, things got passed down. And, you know, my mother-in-law, she hip hinges perfectly. And she used to feel guilty that she's not, you know, she doesn't ever get sick and stuff. So <laughs> she's like very, very healthy, beautiful form. Okay, let's thank our speakers.